Welcome, everyone. This is Michael. We have Andrew, Patrick, Brian, Rod, Jan, and Antrenig so far. Uh, of the topics I want to discuss, I know Santiago is being bitten by this, I believe, Broadcom driver bug. I put that in the in the document there. I'll throw it in the chat. And I'm being bitten by, and I didn't get a link when I did that, I'm being bitten by this panic on the PQI driver on a <laughs> Epic system. So that's uh, kind of annoying because 14 is dead in the water on my HPE Epic. Um, if anyone has ideas, thoughts, who to talk to, it's appreciated because, wow. What's, like What driver is that, PQI? Uh, it's a, it's a, I believe, a SAS controller driver. And it's not LSI, uh, thank you very much. So anyway. Is uh, it part of a generic configuration? Yes. Otherwise, you could blacklist it in the deathmatch. Or you uh, this could mask is... the device to at least boot and then debug it at runtime. Uh, that, you're not mask wrong, although PD I was trying to do my initial on. installation to it, which is... Oh, understandable, but... Uh, block the device at runtime. Oh, I like that. Anyway, so then I'm no, glad... No, don't, you, you won't even get to... Burn. You have to block it in the loader conf. The old-fashioned way, yep. like you would blog it for a PCI pass-through. Pass-through device, yep. To mask it because the pass-through driver has, the, I think, the maximum priority. So it takes precedence over the normal driver, preventing it from attaching. So that should allow your system to boot without your uh, local SCSI HBA. True, but that might leave me with USB and network, but... Yeah, which that. is enough to debug. <laughs> uh, this is true. This is true. Especially and of course, Epic it doesn't system, have a hardware serial port. You could just create a 64 gig um, memory disk and fill it once if you ha even have to. Mm -hmm. And they have USB 3 on uh, at least two ports on the chipset. Unless they're used up internally and there's no other USB controller, you should have at least two 5 gigabit USB ports on an Epic system. This is true. So get yes. yourself a USB SSD uh, case and happy debugging. Thank you. They're plentiful. Um, I suspect Antrenig and I have some topics that y'all might find interesting. Uh, Jan, do you have any I, news on your... Uh, Go ahead, back, Rodney. Hang yes, on. Yeah, yeah, uh, what happened to device hints? Can't we just... Can't you just device hint disable that device? That would be possible. If the driver support, it needs to support in the individual devices. This is this is device hints, and it should just stop it from yeah. even calling the pro, the pro. You know, the bus infrastructure. I don't know where in the bus it attaches. It would be to, up to the PCI or whatever. No, new bus. Man page the... man section five device dot hints. Yeah. I thought there was a way to hint dot driver dot unit dot keyword equals value. Yeah, and and you can set it to disabled, and it should cause that driver unit keyword to not probe. Um, not probe, but it still loads. If there's maybe a regression, nobody else has found, and even just yeah, loading. but it isn't. I don't think it'll never cause any code in it, so it doesn't matter if it loaded. It never runs the code that's panicking. Would right, it's things like the whole, the, uh, driver. The, the whole driver. reason that that hint dot driver exists with the disabled value is so that you can effectively rip out in kernel device drivers that are causing you problems. Of, um, you're stopping individual instances of a driver. Isn't there some setup code for the driver itself? Potentially some uh, talk that, which could does it have a problem. But yeah, and isn't there something in loader? Yeah, may... Just loading the whole driver, basically, even to not load included modules. Well, this isn't. It's but it's, it's the module. Well, Ninety nine percent of the time, you have a driver problem because it's almost always doing the part you disable.
oh, the, the old example of disabling the first ACPI device is not going to um, be much use on modern systems. <laughs> because you need ACPI to find the interrupt controllers for your uh, application processes. Andrew, apologies if we're deep in FreeBSD land. No um, worries. Okay, cool. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I can definitely get it to boot until it tastes the device. So I guess I can ignore it and maybe find it. Actually, I, I see that as like a, either the formatting or new FS or something that breaks it as a service. So welcome Daniel B. Um, hey, do you have any hot topics because there's a risk of Antrenig and I diving into Occam BSD and getting feedback from the group? So I'd love to hear from uh, you. Not uh, to the have... spot entirely. <laughs> Oh no, I have nothing too exciting. I uh with with Clara fixed a terrible uh net graph beehive bug. Um Ooh, so if tell. anybody's having trouble with it. so it the it the um uh net graph isn't as smart as disabling um uh LRO, uh which is a uh oh offloading. Yeah. Large so, receive offloading. Yeah, so it doesn't. So when you make a bridge in FreeBSD, a typical bridge, <laughs> it'll, auto again. it'll it'll automatically it'll it'll automatically disable that on the on the interfaces. Now this only applies to shitty interfaces. So if anybody's using good, uh, good network interface cards, it's fine. If you're using shitty network interface cards, I'm sorry, I'm using the the, the well, medium French shitty. technical. <laughs> yeah, if you're using uh what is it uh broad broadcom or whatever. Um, what driver name? Does it happen to be the BNXT which is the yeah. thing that leads this meeting? Okay, thank you broadcom. Your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so just remember to add your minus LRO in your in your physical interfaces if you're going to be using a a um a beehive host with um uh yeah, with 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 netcraft or or anything that might 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 be, you know, that that might be touchy about about that. Now LRO actually does get disabled with conventional uh, with conventional bridge connections. That's why if you've ever noticed, sometimes on on you'll attach a bridge and then the thing will stall for a second. And I think that's because the interface is smart enough to know that it's it's shutting off LRO. Um, um, it's even worse. Uh, it's not enough to just disable LRO uh, because there's also LRO for inside VLANs and for IPv4 or V6. So you have to make sure to look for anything like TSO or uh, LRO in the EF config flags and disable it all until it works and then figure out what you can re-enable. Now, Jan we had that problem. It... Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, I just wanted to mention we did we did have that problem with the TSO uh, that sometimes some interfaces, notably I think it was some kind of an Intel, it also didn't disable the TSO. We had to disable it manually, and if you have the TSO non disabled on non disabled on Virt IO, although do support TSO, some don't. I don't know how that even happens. Um, maybe there's something on the Chemu level that's happening on the hosting providers. Yes, and if does. you then enable PF, then everything is very goddamn slow. Um, right. What happens so, if you uh, leave TSO enabled, I've debugged this once on an Intel NIC, uh, is that as soon as the packet rate is high enough for TSO to aggregate multiple frames into one synthetic larger frame, it all breaks. The packets get garbled and discarded. And TCP responds by probing the available bandwidth, treating it as a very congested link until it paced itself slow enough to not trigger the uh, TSO most of the time. So you're limited to a few kilobits uh, over your gigabit ethernet or faster, Nick. So Jan, do you think that it's good practice to do this for uh, uh, 
you know, a, a jail and VM host, regardless of no, which. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so what are the situations where I need to be worried? Basically, whenever the kernel has to see the unmodified packet, this the no, normal things uh, where this happens is software bridging, uh, forwarding to other systems. So if it's a router, and these are the normal things. But if, what doesn't trigger these special cases is adding alias IPs for uh, jails. Got it. OK. So. This is one of the things where you really want to leave it enabled because it can really reduce your interrupt rate and thereby the contact switch overhead. And it really helps with performance on lower speed systems or with fast networks. So you kind of want to leave it enabled. For example, if you have a FreeBSD or whatever system running jails or another kind of OS level virtualization, you don't want the overhead of disabling all your offloading features in the NIC because so then your the... CPU won't keep up with a 10 gig or faster network. And even if it does keep up with a 10 gig network, it does so by wasting all of your valuable CPU cycles. So let me um, give you a not let me give you a not hypothetical. So I, I want to uh, start running my web servers on on 10G. It's embarrassing that I'm you know, I'm not I'm not okay. doing that yet, but I'm getting myself up to date. So I bought two uh, two machines, and I what I wanted them to be was to be my routers. They would run Varnish, and they would run, um, and then they would Varnish load, load isn't from... routing. One Varnish terminates the TCP connection and then proxies the content. Right, but so you can but run Varnish I, but, with all of this enabled. So, but but I was going to say that that's that's. But that's my. But that's exactly my point. I was going to use these machines as routers as well. So you think I should not use them as routers? I should only use them for. Uh, I should. I should keep LRO and so, and etc. enabled and not use them as routers. Is that would that no, be your I, suggestion? I'm not saying that because it it's just in, increasing the CPU accessing. Repeat okay. you cut out but there. if you have those cycles, it's still better to put more lo load on your CPU cores in one system than running two systems. Right, right. Okay. If yes. Yes. This and at ten gig, depending on your packet rates and traffic mix and so on, it can still work out fine. Uh, okay, but but that's it. something that's something Keep I should think about. Yeah, that's something I should think about if I if I'm hitting if I'm bumping up against what you could uh, do some limits. If you have dual port network cards, is run one port with offloading and the other without? Of course, yes, that's that's uh, of course the solution. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, that's not the solution. It's a workaround. <laughs> <laughs> well, it okay. works for me. May, may, may I chime in? And uh, because uh, in, of course. In, uh, in in my business and in the support I do for OpenSense and, and for TrueNAS, these these hardware offload flags are one of the most frequent topics that bites users in one way or another. And um, do I understand it correctly that uh, these hardware features only do anything good? if we are speaking of TCP connections that are terminated at the host? 99% uh, of them. There's one if you have, but I don't know if FreeBSD even supports this generic offloading. What it does is it's inherently a stateful optimization. The yep. NIC aggregates the packets of a per flow in, and rewrites the headers. And it can't really do that for... Uh, UDP because it has to maintain mm -hmm. the uh, message boundaries. Maybe it the uh, kernel network stack and driver agree with the hardware and firmware to lie to each other and treat the 1.5 kilobyte mm -hmm. MTU um, as uh, not really a problem with uh, TCP mm -hmm. headers. But this requires a lot of yeah, well, I, 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 I got as much. It's, it's just the, the point is, I, in my environment, I have I can't think of a single host hosting applications that is not also a bridge or a router or both. 
exactly which because is why you run it makes because no you sense. run you, because you run applications in jails and boom there you are no 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 a jail does not require bridging or routing the classical old fashioned way of running jails we we're, we're uh, using puts VNet. multiple you, alias we're, addresses yeah. on we we're, we're, we're using vnet exclusively of course i will say Planet very curiously on how you use vnet because i will say you, sorry I, Sorry, um, I will say very curiously that I use VNet with NetGraph and jails, and they seem fine. It's only, it's only actually what it, what I've no, where I've noticed the biggest problem is with Windows VMs that are using Virtio. I it's it's very it's very strange, but I wasn't having the same problem with jails, okay. and I can't I can't explain that. Um, so we have to uh, differentiate between jails, uh, and the potential different network configuration types. The simplest case uh, is don't virtualize the network at all. The jail inherits the full network stack mm -hmm. minus a few security restrictions. This is a fairly recent mode. The oldest mode is the jail is uh, inherits the network stack and is restricted to a subset of the IP addresses. It used to be a single IPv4 address. Now it's a set of IP addresses. IPv4 and V6, there is no uh, SRIOV involved uh, in this jail stuff. But uh, what happens now is that the full optimization on the uh, host can take place, and it only has to look at the TCP connection and so on to figure out where the socket belongs. So you can use this optimization. Then there is the mode you're probably using in PFSense. Uh, the image or a VNet, the, this jail has its own instance of a network stack with its own interfaces, and those have to connect to the uh, host in some way. The, uh, the simple common way of doing that is either through routing, which if you're familiar and comfortable with routing is, in my opinion, the best way, but the more common way is to uh, use... Uh, all of these problems appear, uh, which uh, Patrick just mentioned, and just disable it here. Um, what else is there? Well, you have the option of, in theory, going through NetMap and Veil, but SRIOV would be another way because the VNet enabled jail requires disabling these features because it normally uses bridging. It's the bridging, not the jails part, which causes the problem. So if you have another way of attaching the jail to your network, for example, if you have, I don't know, four dual port networking cards in there and you just dedicate full networking cards to jails, mm -hmm. then you can do whatever you want in a jail with it and don't have to disable those features. You could use TC, total TCP IP offloading with kernel TLS encryption in a jail and would work fine. You could also just, as you, as you mentioned, use routing because the ePair interface is uh, an yes. Ethernet with, with two nodes on um, it. So the host can serve as a router for the jail if you can. Sadly, still most common, but also most finicky ways uh, of processing packings is IPv4 uh, address translation, so NAT. Mm -hmm. uh, lib alias breaks in horrible ways if it sees the rewritten headers because uh, the uh, LO and TSO is only an optimization. So basically the net state and the TSO or LRO state get desynchronized and the packets are no longer translated. Or... Yeah, I, I observed that in, in digital ocean droplets. That when oh, matter, as long as using that ocean, they are <laughs> utterly incompetent. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> for, for Vulture when they drop free BSD support, but I was a little okay. bit puzzled by a, a VTNet, a, a virtual VTIO interface, uh, having problems with with TSO or LRO or any, mm -hmm. any of these flags. I, I disabled them all because I thought a virtual interface does not even have that feature. But so, here we go. Uh, I had a Patrick does the same situation that we were in because we have to support our operating system on both vendors and uh, Volter has a lot more cleaner virtio stack uh, they don't do any restrictions if their 
concept of an internal network is like a literal internal network, not nothing that does modification to the packets compared to digital ocean. That, that's indeed true for, for both of them. Uh, Jan, a single question, because I missed the point, I guess. Mm-hmm. One of them is VNet to do jail networking. The other one is the old school inherit, where you can say that the jail IPv4 equals blah, blah, blah in the jail configuration. Did you say that there's another way to configure a jail? I, I, I didn't yes. understand so that. There are basically three ways. Uh, you can specify a set of addresses per address family in the jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the original way. The a jail is, has some IP addresses. It shares with the host. The host has to be configured to leave those addresses alone unless hilarity ensues. Um, <laughs> because then uh, basically if both bound, bind the any address on the same port, you get a different behavior, which is more or less uh, um, excusable, depending. Yeah. I remember. Oh. Oh. So so, 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 if the, it used to be that whoever bound first wins. Uh, now it, I think it prefers the jail over the host or something. But the proper configuration is still avoid this ever happening. Prepare your host, bind all services to well-known addresses, which will not okay. be delegated to the jails, and you just define this problem case array. Okay, so so the one that you're talking about, the original way, that's the one that was written in the original Le- jail paper yeah, or doing exactly the, the TFTP. In the original okay. version, it was one IPv4 address per jail. Exactly. Okay. And you could put that on your loopback address and use some firewall and NAT to do port forwarding. Yep. Or if you yep. had a better network uh, available, you could just put alias addresses on the host yep. and avoid all the overhead with uh, NAT port forwarding and routing or bridging or whatever you have to do otherwise. Um, but that only okay. works I see. if your network supports you that way. So I see, I see. This, uh, pa- Patrick, my heart just disables this, and the jail gets full access to the host networking stack of its parent, which could, in theory, be in other jail now that decibel jails are available. Mm-hmm. So you could have something like put an intermediate jail configure the restrictions on there and then have a child jail containing some service, for example, Beehive, and use the jail for resource management, the service jail, but use the outer jail, which could also be persistent for access management. I see. This can help, but it's a complicated deployment to explain to someone not familiar with how jails work. And the latest and greatest and most flexible way is to have the jail instantiate its own networking stack. This is really a a great feature and it took a long time to mature. But now that it is usable, um, you have to attach the jail network stack to the outside world because just creating a network stack only gets you a network stack with maybe a loopback interface and nothing else. And it's attached through a bridge or what? You you have lots of options. The (laughs) most, that's a problem. It's a tool chest and you have to decide what to do. It's only mechanisms. It's almost no policy built in. It's not an opinionated tool like Docker, where you're holding it wrong is their preferred answer and everything can be copy and pasted from a two page tutorial because they have hardwired most decisions for you. So um, the inner jails have to be connected to the outside network most of the time to be useful, unless you want a very, very isolated, secure environment. Um, Which is a valid there is a use case. Pseudo networking interface called ePair. It's l- like an, a crossover cable in software. Uh, it's 
a pair of Ethernet-like interfaces, and you can put one end of this virtual uh, crossover cable into the host and the other into the jail. And if you take the interface on the host, configure it up and throw it into a bridge, put the physical NIC of the host on the bridge as well, and put the IP address, especially the IPv6 addresses, on the bridge interface, your network works as you expect it to. And this, this is a very common, and at least I assume so, and same deployment. The problem with this is that you have to use bridging and lots of documentation and so on I've seen around these features. Um, assume that you will put the physical network interface in a bridge and all e pairs will have one end on the bridge as well. And so this is commonly associated with all the bridging problems, but nothing in VNet inherently requires this. In theory, if you feel comfortable doing that, you could uh, run some IGP routing protocol on the host, like BERT with OSPF, and just announce the uh, ePair addresses um, with a wildcard, but you say all log direct connected ePair interfaces get announced into the uh, OSPF zone so and so. And then you could even have, now that it has been patched in, I think, uh, you could cost multi path routing instead of uh, link aggregation and so on. But good luck finding staff who can uh, understand such a system. Just because someone may mean uh, the bus factor will ever raise above. Uh, two or so, and no. I would recommend thinking hard about really deploying this because you have to have operators with so many different fields of expertise to troubleshoot this kind of network <laughs> that it gets complicated. Just hire people who used to run a classical ISP in their past. Um, there's, <laughs> there, 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 there's a middle way that I feel pretty comfortable with. You can create a bridge interface that is not attached to any physical one, assign an mm -hmm. IP address and some subnetwork to it, and uh, also assign all your jails ePair interfaces as members to that bridge and use the host system as the default gateway for all the bridged uh, jails. So the jails are still... So the jails are still bridged, have the same configuration, route out through the ePair, but you don't pollute your broadcast domain on the physical interface as much as you do if you map oh, yes. everything yeah. on the physical. So that exactly. keeps, keeps the broadcast domain smaller and contains the jails MAC addresses to a single host. The downside is, of course, that you need routing, but we started to move static routing. away from from our data center to Hetzner, and uh, they assign a fixed slash 64 to each host that you rent. And then we use that. We, we pick a single address with a slash 128 net mask for the external interface of the host and keep everything else private to, to the bridge interface. And that, that works pretty well. It, it I was just going to ask if someone... Sorry. I was just going to ask if someone is actually running e pairs with IPv6 in the more modern part of the planet, but yeah, that's that's a good thing to hear. That yes, we we we, we are dual problem. stack through throughout all our infrastructure. Do we don't uh, have IPv4 only anywhere, be apart the from like, with, a printer or something? Uh, the problem with uh, bridging the physical interface to your uh, virtual machines is that you quickly run out of. Um, MAC address table or camp space in the top of MAC switches. And if you have IPv4 at enabled, you will have an unbelievable amount of broadcast traffic for uh, if you enable, and, and neighbor discovery and all of that. Yes, stuff. and all of it. Well, neighbor discovery, you can kind of manage if you sniff it, but it's still, you can manage the packet rate, but the state will kill you because you have to track um, the multicast group memberships. 
for, 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 for the issue detection. for the issue regarding ARP, uh, we use our own tool Jailer, which which generates a MAC address and sets it in some location. And what we ended up doing is we set the uh, we set static ARP we set static ARP addresses in 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 the machines since we already know before even the jail boots up what it is so in this way no one has to ever ask an ARP request otherwise if you have an infrastructure for example i have an infrastructure with with hundreds of jails well hundred and something of jails mm -hmm. the amount of ARP requests in there is massive and before christoph's i think it was christoph's patch to bridge it it would just like die kind of you know, it, it the bridge couldn't handle that many packets going back and forth. It used to be in FreeBSD before 13 that the bridge had one, driver had one mutex per bridge interface to track the uh, MAC address table. So, and it had to be locked to V to get a consistent view at the hash table. And this didn't scale at all. So, Per interface, your only solution was to have enough bridges for your number of cores to keep the mutex from becoming too glowing hot. And the fix in FreeBSD 13 is to rewrite the bridge driver to make use of a new EPAC, uh, epoch concurrency control, which basically is RCU without the patterns. And that scales really well to at least 16 or maybe even 32 logical cores. I haven't seen any uh, benchmarks how it holds up beyond that. But uh, sadly, the ePair driver, at least in 13.0, was not yet rewritten. So you got performance problems per e per air when connecting jails because the basically the handing off of the packets between the two networking stacks is still uh, implemented with one mutex per virtual crossover cable but at least the bridge can scale the nice thing about routing is that you can aggregate a lot unless you have very many host routes, you could have a prefix per host and allocate that. And only if you really, really have to keep an IP address, which has to move, you get these kind of problems, but it's only at layer three. So you, you don't have to have the data and control plane so tightly integrated. Uh, anonymous Squirrel, you jumped in with some points related to Patrick, but I saw your hands off the keyboard. Uh, does someone want to comment on the paragraph that was just added? Um, Daniel commented in the chat oh, that's that it. this is also possible using oh. NetGraph. Uh, yes, you can use the AE phase uh, NetGraph class um, to create NetGraph uh, nodes, which are also Ethernet interfaces on the normal IP stack. What is eFace? I've never heard of that. Uh, it's just a... Uh, it, let Daniel yeah. go ahead and do that. Go. Thank oh, you. yeah. It's, it's oh, just energy. a... Yeah, it's just a virtual interface. So you would use a single virtual interface as your routing interface for a bunch of private uh, VMs and jails. Um, the jails would need a EI face interface as well. So they would need their own private interface as a, you know, as an alternative to an ePair. Um, and then for the VMs, they, they just use a direct socket to net graph. That's built into Beehive. Um, Is this documented anywhere on this planet beyond your own yes, configuration? It actually, okay. <laughs> it actually is. The, the documentation's actually not half, half bad. Okay, I dropped the manual page in there, but wow. Yeah, it's it's actually quite it's actually quite well well complaints that netgraph isn't extremely well maintained but um but the documentation is quite good okay great i i i, 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 
I think what we're missing from NetGraph, from my own personal point of view, I, I'm we run our you know the hundred plus infrastructure with all e pairs and bridges. Uh, like we even have, you know, multiple bridges on a single host to isolate the networks, blah, 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 the typical thing. But the problem is that there's not the, the not the lack of documentation is the problem. The lack of a tutorial or a how to is the problem, yeah. uh, specifically for people who are coming from ePair. It's it's uh, it it takes a good amount of time to understand the concept of lower uh, thing and uh, what. Well, well, but Daniel, what was the terminology? A lower and a higher? No, a lower and lower, a upper. Yeah, you need a lower and upper connection to upper, yeah, between yeah, each exactly. each physical interface to your to your bridge. Yeah, which is yeah, and it's I mean I think that it's it's old school networking terminology, but uh, I yeah. I honestly just do it you know kind of blindly. I I, I use the the there's a Clara document. I forget who wrote that. Um, on the subject, and then I just sort of expanded on that and made my own tools um, based on that. Um, and then, thankfully, just just really a couple months ago, um, uh, VMB Hive added NetGraph support, so it it puts that on Rails, which makes it really easy to use. Uh, I mean, just as easy to use NetGraph and uh, and VMs. Um, well, maybe not just as easy, but <laughs> almost as almost as easy to use uh, NetGraph and uh, and uh, VMs on the same network that you would jails and then bridge through a NetGraph bridge. So um, yeah, thank you to the VM Beehive folks for uh, for that new do, development. Do you know if any of the jail managers support that? No, and that's, no, I've uh, always ours been, does. Yeah, I've always been like a so, step behind, like a like just a step ahead of all the jail managers. I'm, I'm always, because I, I I'm obsessed with jail management, so I've, I've, jail.conf is, is just it's just the it's just the best for me. I've I've never found anything that 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 has the flexibility. And frankly, jail.conf now that there's jail.conf.d, I I almost don't really understand what a jail manager does for you between ZFS and you know and and jail.conf. I mean, I guess I guess it training ties it together. Yeah, I guess training somebody on on you know Bastille would be like a, a couple you know it would be a couple days quicker than training somebody on JailConf, um, but but then you get all get all these limitations like the ZFS support on all these jail managers also isn't isn't perfect for me like I think the jail management or, sorry the ZFS management on VM Beehive is actually pretty sweet it works. It works well. They have shorthands for where your Z vols are, and it deals with all the different types of network interfaces that you want to do and stuff like that. I haven't found something quite that uh, combo of simplicity and flexibility in the in the jail side. Nice, uh, Patrick. We we have a jail manager called the Jailer. It is open source. It's published, but because we haven't finished the NetGraph integration. Mostly that's my my bad. I, I I haven't had the time to learn it to integrate it properly. I haven't blogged or written anything about it. But it does handle the e pairs very well, and also the old school uh, inherit networks. So you know you could easily say dash b uh, em zero or dash b bridge zero, and it will understand if this is should be an e pair or anything like that. And it also handles static MAC addresses on the jails. So if you're running DHCP, uh, your v, your your e pair wouldn't get a DHCP a separate MAC address when it boots. And as far as I know, Jailer might be the only one who does static MAC addresses. But don't 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 don't, don't hold me accountable on that. I, I, I okay, you post the link to that, please. We 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 run everything on IO cage, and uh, you can uh, statically configure the MAC address for each e pair. Uh, just the same. Uh, it will generate one dynamically when you first power up the jail and there isn't a MAC address assigned, and then record that in the configuration. So it's, it's uh, yeah. dynamically generated but static. We are looking into a, an IO cage replacement, but from this conversation, I will take away that we need to look into uh, jail.conf and probably doing away with any manager at all. As much as I applaud your effort, but we it's all ansible for us anyway. So probably yeah. just the way to go. Oh yes. Yeah. If you're already yeah. using Ansible, that's your um most your flexible chain manager of them all. 
Uh, and, and by the way, j j j j Jailer doesn't do anything like uh, uh, the other jail managers. It's literally a wrapper of jail.conf.d. Because oh, I created nice. jail.conf.d in order, like it, the only thing that it does oh. is putting things into files. It, it, so yep. for example, we actually had this as an exercise is create a jail with a jailer, then do package remove jailer and see if everything is running just as before. Like that's the, that was the actual goal of jailer. That was really great. So I could start with your manager, yeah. which has some convenient flags and shortcuts to create things and then look what is in the config files that are generated. That's really nice. Yeah, jailer is definitely the one that I'd most likely want to uh, import my that graph stuff into and and use if I was going to pick one, for sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, and if 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 you do have any jail specific requests, I'll be happy to add to the jailer feature set. The only request that we had right now is a Docker file style something for developers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, okay, sure, we'll, we'll add that. But no one else has ever requested anything else for now, at least. So, and I, only DCH uh, was the only person who also requested. And if you do use IOKH, please tell me if this is true, where the root of the jail and the, let's say the application data of the jail can be in separate ZFS data sets, which they both can. mount, which both mount into the jail. So you can destroy the jail, but not the data. How does that work? I, I never got into that. Is, is that true? Um, is, that, it is that worth by, exploring? Uh, it works similar to port. There are basically two options. Either you can have a directory on the host under some common prefix and then a data a directory name and you nullfs mount it in. That's one way. And with ZFS, you can also um, mount it by changing the mount point into the jail. And if the jail is stopped in the parent data set to be unmounted, you would have to change the mount point array or unmount it. And you can even go in some jail managers like port one step further and delegate the data set to the jail so that it can do its own ZFS snapshot management if you want to pass this through. The second part is a lot more uh, reasonable, you know, just giving the jail to the, giving the data set to the jail, which I think would be ideal for hosting providers as well. For hosting providers, yes, but for someone treating the jails as a platform to run applications in, I would want to keep the data retention and backup policies part of the platform and not force it on the uh, application if it doesn't need it. Unless you have very specific requirements, just making sure that the platform ensures that automated backups happen and are replicated is more reliable and easier to deal with. And the same applies to uh, Beehive uh, disk uh, in one way or the other. With Beehive, you can have uh, multiple disks get, and you can have one for the operating system and one for the data. And I would recommend doing that because you can use snapshots in that case and clone and fork to prototype things. And you can, have, for example, take the data of an application, whether it's in a jail or in a Beehive guest, uh, snapshot it, clone the snapshot, try the migration, and only once the migration works, uh, you convert the actual primary data set. And I wouldn't say that nullfs is unreasonable. It's very useful for small things. And it's uh, it enables sharing read only even uh, directories between multiple instances. If you have to have like, a dozen instances uh, of the same jail service for some reason, uh, it's useful to have a read-only share for site local configuration and stuff like this. You, you can even do something like use it for, for IPC. Like, yes. uh, and, uh, like NullFS mounting some data set where there is a, a MySQL socket. socket. 
and then use this in multiple jails that all mount it, which is exactly really, really nice. I, I love everything that provides uh, full local POSIX semantics. Exactly. Well, we'll got into it's an great. argument with, with Jordan Hubbard about that when we try to introduce the Plan 9 portal FS thingy uh, as the solution. Not quite sure if that is, that is stable now. But uh, the 9P uh, client and server? Yeah, the 999 PFS. Yeah. Too bad that uh, FreeBSD still lacks an in base or the even in port uh, 9P con yeah. side client. Well, Beehive. Oh, it exists. It. it just needs a lot of love. Juniper produced one. Yeah. So I was looking at it, but not a thing. A uh, very quick point before I forget uh, 14 introduces file based null FS. So that you can okay. add, rather than a directory, you can say one file gets in there, and uh, so it's kind of cool. You can build a jail of completely yeah, linked in you know, components. Go ahead. You slice the VNode layer in half or something? Hey, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a recent patch. Yes, you're right. Yes, so you're the right. VFS it is, it is, name it is, it is, support for layer. mount points, which aren't directories. Or how is that even implemented? Or does it just fake, uh, which is unreachable because a file is put on top of it or something? Because, oh, that sounds like a good way to discover assumptions. Let's see. I think okay. it was at NullFS, unless I'm thinking of something, a different component. Let me try the 14 manual page. Um, so I, I renamed a beehive binary into a text file and it was suddenly a text file. <laughs> it's like, okay, interesting. Uh, but unfortunately I'll have to leave. I have a, another appointment at uh, seven, my local time, which is in, in eight minutes. And I need a short break before that. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, it's been a while. Some customer sure. migration. Nice seeing you again. We'll be back next time or the time after that, but much more frequently than during the last couple of months. Thank you very cool. much. Hey, welcome. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Any any joint? Uh, sorry, any uh, Illumos people here? Uh, Andrew, I H am an Illumos person. Ta -da. Hello there. Uh, the, 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 just to be clear, do you use zones? Yes. Uh, is it true that when you use, I think it's called crossbow, right? You can limit that the zone can't change its IP address from the inside. Is that correct? Uh, I, yes, I believe so. Okay, I see. I mean, is are that, you talking, is... well, are you talking about just which zone type are you talking about is the question. Uh... Oh, oh, I see. I see. Because one of the problems a Lumos, that I... a Lumos will use that zone interface. Okay. okay. Or you can use it for like an LI package zone, which is okay. a completely different beast. That's much closer to what the BSD people would call jails. Okay. Mm -hmm. You called it what an LI package? Oh. Yeah, it's a it's a linked Linux. It's Go ahead and describe that or link it. Uh, no, that's uh, you're thinking of an LX package. Uh, LI oh. package is a uh, linked image, so it has this. It has most of the same. Um, most of the user space comes from the parent OS anyway. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. To to minimize the, um, the amount of space you're using for it. Um, that used to be. Uh the most common FreeBSD jail deployment strategy as well. Yeah. Um, Thin jails as we Either um, NullFS or ZFS snapshots and clones or um, combinations of NullFS and symlinks for the most extreme configurations. Something like easy jail could have a jail reduced to a few uh, dozen kilobytes Okay. Yeah, we, we all think ultimately the questions about networking. Yeah, because yeah, one of the problems that we have with jails that have a separate network stack, so similar to Crossbow, is assuming if an attacker got to into my jail, uh, and assuming that they also got root somehow, let's let's just assume that they also got root inside the jail. Okay, my host is protected. 
but they can uh, practically at that point do if config and set the IP address of the jail to anything else. So, you know, the worst case scenario is setting the IP address of the jail, the same IP address of the host, you know, the, the gateway of yeah. the other jails, which is, and now, okay, now my whole network is like dead, you know, um, but I, uh, I understand I know these zones. In that yeah. case, your network is misconfigured. Well, I know there's, <laughs> I know there's zones, like, like normal zones, um, you can set it so that it's actually specified, and okay. uh, you can't, and it can't be changed. Um, I think for the beehive zones through crossbow, you can set, you can specify what the permitted IPs are, okay. and so anything else is blocked. Yeah, it may look like they change it within the OS, but no traffic mm -hmm. will be able to get through. I would double Understood. check that though. I mean, okay. I, I would I would actually run a test to try to do it. Okay. As, but I believe that's how it works. Okay. And and Jan, you said that if something like that happens, means that my network is misconfigured. What what would be your solution for a scenario like this? So the most solution would be to put a a few static firewall rules with IPFW on the interface connecting the VNet enabled jail to the uh, host network. So that would be IPFW allow yeah. from jail this IP. It would, be, uh, it would probably be some IPFW, uh, a simple in dispatch on the interface in a table. Okay. To have a single rule dispatching on the interface uh, jump to something else or to make use of table arcs uh -huh. to keep the rule number, uh, rule count small enough. So IPFW isn't a ready to use firewall in my consideration, but a firewall construction kit. Okay. Compared to something like PF. Um, one of the things uh, which IPW has on offer lacking in PF is that tables aren't just sets of IP addresses or nested sets of IP addresses, but uh, complicated key value maps. So to, to clarify this, are you referring to BSD yes. specifically? Okay, yes. I, I just want to make that clear. Throw you there. <laughs> because yes. okay. the only. Um, the thing is that with it, you can have uh, the um, table entry can map to possible value. And you you can match on things like the an interface or something else. And you could have a jump to a rule number put in there. And you would have a table oh, mapping from incoming interface to rule number to jump to. I see. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, your solution is based on the, f the, the, the firewall, or in this case, specifically IPFW. Uh, I was thinking if we can patch the uh, VNet stack to make it in a way that, mm -hmm. okay, VNet number 10 is allowed this a specific IP address, regardless if that's an ePair or is, a... If you want or... to enable... Uh, DHCP inside the uh, oh. the jail, it needs to open a raw socket. Yeah. And with a raw socket, it can it spoof um, the addresses for an attack, at least. If you're yeah. talking about yeah. a creative young student wanting to show the old file that he can, can bring down the network, then this is what you would have to defend against. If you have a board student with a lot of time and tenacity, <laughs> um, that was wanting you, huh? to show, hmm? yeah, that was you, huh? Then, okay. Once, a, yeah, it was. Um, I was a pain in the uh, posterior, <laughs> but um, anyway, the thing is that you can do, do a lot of this, but if you limit your jails to the classical alias networking, then they are restricted to those yeah, alias of addresses. Of course. And the other thing is, if you have a routed network configuration, not a jail, then you have the isolation, which being 
a layer three interface provides. So yes. there is no shared layer two to attack because the, the layer two is only be sh shared between this one interface on the host and whatever the guest contains. Yes. Okay, that does make sense. That does make absolute sense. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I'm also asking is Jailer has a very tight integration with PF. Our model is, you know, add a single line, which is include blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And, it, um, uh, then, we, then we manage a single file. And I would love to see a way where I specify, when we create the GL and specify the IP address. This is, of course, if, the, if, if, yeah, if, this is, of course, if it's not using the HCP to hard code um, that e pair 10 is supposed to use this specific IP address. So that might be a good scenario. What you could do is you could uh, use uh, two layers of PF anchors. Mm hmm one for jailer and then one per jail. Yes. And PF can read the per anchor PF conf rules from a standard input. Oh, I see. So I jailer see, could see, produce uh, it I and see. you you could even use a, con a shared pf.com for the invocation because I think you can pass a macro bindings on yes. the command line. Uh, let see. me check that. Yeah, so when the, when the jail case uh, D allows you to pass a macro value, mm -hmm. and then so, you so. could have a rule set um, for this. So basically, Where when the jail boots, this... since I know the IP address after its boot or before its boot, no, you know, depending you on would the situation, load a static uh, PF conf or per configuration PF conf. We use for multiple jails, and it may be possible to just set a few macros uh -huh. in the PFCTL invocation in your jailer script so that you wouldn't even have one per jail. jail. Because let's be honest, templating and string expansion gets hairy quickly. Instead, you would have your uh, PF conf snippet to be loaded into an anchor and then an anchor with including all sub anchors by having a path ending in a slash uh, star. So include everything under this prefix in the, because PF anchors can have a hierarchical structures. Um, mm. It may also help if you have an anchor only on an interface. So you can have treat anchors like scopes where you have an anchor and then on some interface so that PF can skip over the whole anchor unless it's processing a packet oh. on this interface. I see. I see. I see. These and kinds of optimizations correct. to your rule set um, allow PF, similar to what I previously described with IPFW, to minimize the cost to other traffic. I see. I see. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Illumos friends are feeling here like we feel in Linux talks. I'm, I'm so sorry. This just went too long. <laughs> it's good stuff because often this isn't discussed anywhere else or is documented anywhere else. So I, I almost know. wish we could each just belt out some super quick mm -hmm. scenarios because there are like... Um... Dozens of variations on each of these things. Something Go ahead, uh, to try out is if there's uh, an existing uh, free, uh, trusted BSD policy, so with the mandatory access control layer mm -hmm. to restrict this. And if there isn't, it may be worth implementing it that you could have a VNet restricted to which addresses it can configure. That, that's actually a good question because I saw something that it uses the Mac policies with VNet. I'm talking around a year ago in the commits. Unfortunately, my C is not good enough to understand what exactly happened. But since I'm in front of the source tree, let me just do a fast grab and see what we can get out of that. Um, there are also some Mac uh, modules available in the ports tree worth checking out. Really? 
for example? Um, so, uh, the MacNonet uh, kernel module, for example, allows uh, you have a link? disabling networking for certain user groups. That's the one I know about. Uh, and that free access control is that how should I find it? I have no idea. Yeah, I thought it might be tricky. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Jan, can you give an exact port name? Um, the package is named Mac underscore nonet dash kmod. There's also one I didn't know about, which allows uh, specifying that some uh, group is allowed to use real-time priority, which could also be interesting for networking functions. Uh, because yeah. it will, uh, uh, eliminate the need for this group to have temporary um, root permissions to gain a real-time scheduling priority and then drop the privileges again. Well, the no-net came out is there. Uh, yeah. um, what is also available, but not um, back related, is um, the PAM modules around jailing. For example, to have a PAM session jail itself, which can be used to uh, run an SSH server on the host and have the, before it drops to the user, the forked SSH child will then use the PUM module to jail itself. And you could then have a SSH session into a jail with no networking. Wow, okay. You can have a jail with configured with, oh, that is the fourth networking configuration I forgot to mention about jails. You can also disable networking in a jail so that it has neither IPv4 nor IPv6. But can it you has think of the name for that PAM module? Uh, no, no, there isn't. The PAM module is just called PAM jail. PAM jail. Thank you. How, how does that work? That uh, uh, jail how has does SSH work? but um, no networking? The SSH server runs on the host, which you SSH in as a user. The PAM SSH config, uh, the PAM configuration for SSH uh, has this module. It searches the home directory for the sequence slash knob in a path and this knob gets turned into the basically like uh, it used to be done for some demons to treat this as a marker where to split the path to jail into oh. instead of change root into and because the tcp connection is already established and in the socket just like any other file descriptor as a capability in unix it doesn't need a network stack because it doesn't create new sockets. It's just an established oh. file descriptor. And the SSH client process, uh, sorry, the SSH server process handling this client connection um, can enter the jail and is then locked in there. And nothing mm -hmm. inside the jail, whether derived from it nor uh, or started inside the jail can uh, e ever leak some, some address. So if you have to work on something where you really don't want it to phone home or ever risk data loss, um, then yes, those are interesting corner cases. So if you want to enable someone to have access to some computational resources, but you don't trust them not to abuse mm -hmm. this privilege to use it again as a TCP proxy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah. It also works with async. <laughs> And I don't think I fully documented SSH. your list of now four jail networking oh, yes. strategies. <laughs> That's <laughs> another uh, crazy uh, uh, use of the Mac framework. Uh, basically a stateless firewall on matching on path names 
user or group IDs of processes to determine which resources in the file system namespace are even accessible. So mm. instead of writing and in, in, in having to deal with um, user permission with mandatory access control or discretion, discretionary access control on a ACL level where you have access control lists, which then have to be inherited and so on, you have a out of band rule set describing who, which user is allowed what. Oh, uh, using and, you said Mac, mandatory uh, access control. already there. There's U G I U G I D F W. Oh, that's the what only, that is. Okay. The only people who I know who uses that is we we use that for very very specific purposes, and I know that DefCon uses that in their infrastructure. I I haven't seen anyone in the world who uses UGI DFW in production. And I don't know why, like instead of managing users and groups, you can just handle handle them like windows like objects. Hello, Jan. Jan. Um, well, yeah, so... I just wanted to make sure that he has seen a second person. <laughs> uh, wait, so that thing, is that in the base OS? Yes. yes. Oh my God. Yes. And it's been okay. there for two... seven or eight or something. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've seen it in eight. Uh, no, even older. It was five, well, so it was one of the original it, imports of Trusted BSD. It, as far as I know, it should have been part of the system from, I'm going to guess, four, five. Five point oh, yeah, it's from yeah. the manual page. Yeah, five point oh, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And, it was yeah. part of the original mandatory access control import. Control, yeah. Um, I love how the more decades pass by, the less I feel I know about this operating system. <laughs> Whatever, such is life. I mean, uh, was that was I even born when that happened? You know, <laughs> at this point, I have to ask that question. Uh, you did uh, not want to be born during the five dot so. release. <clears throat> I hope I didn't say that um, out loud. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't speak about that. Just like the Klingons, right? <laughs> Okay. Three PSD uh, five dot zero or the whole five major release was uh, supposedly it was before my time, but it, uh, I've still encountered people who, who uh, carry their scars with them. Who are traumatized? Yes. Yes, um, I used NetBSD and OpenBSD for years because of it, and produced SysJail and later Malt, all <laughs> because of that release. Thank you very much, and thank you, Christoph. Um, Not that I'm bitter, but. It was painful, but necessary to get SMP into the kernel. Unless you're so every other operating system SMP. on the planet that got SMP in the kernel somehow without boxes no. loading every two uh, days. <laughs> no, no. Other operating systems had similar pain mm -hmm. points where they added multi-core support in the kernel and performance uh, halved or something. Uh, performance or reliability, and those could be different. But let's talk about other happier topics. Anyway, um, it was bad. Um, the, this terribly named UGIFW is fascinating from a NAS perspective. Yes, sir. Is. Good Lord. OK. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if there's a single you know, example on this planet beyond the manual page. Go ahead. And the other thing is, which for a NAS is, you can also match against ranges, just like ranges of port numbers. You can match against ranges of user or group IDs. Interesting. So you, if you allocate continuous ranges to certain classes of users, which are, don't share a common group you or something, or some other pattern, you can exploit this hmm. and have one rule. Hmm. But it's a bit. Uh, the, the, the problem with UGI DFW, we, we just called the file system firewall. I, I don't know who, who the hell named it that. Just quite yeah. itself that way, a firewall yeah. like <laughs> access control for a file system objects in yeah. uh, the main page. Uh, for the file system firewall, my only problem with it has been over the years is that there is no configuration file. So I have my own service. Uh, that loads Etsy, 
u uh, g i d f w dot conf, which is which is actually not yeah. a dot com. It's in reality, it's a dot sh file. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so it, it, you can do it, the following: you can <laughs> set the input separator or pass it through to x arcs and have it break on new line, and then each line oh. will get turned into one invocation of right. u g uh, f w add. And right. the other arguments right. just follow. Of course, it doesn't give you macro expansion and so on, but you can do that. Just have just, just, just like split. just like we use IPFW. Mm, no, IPFW. Uh, um, almost yes, but yeah. the, it's still more common for IPFW to be configured with a shell script. Yeah, I'll definitely document my experience with with the file system firewall because we use it in a, in just a single very specific case, and I'll, I'll try to blog about it. It's a very undocumented segment, and yeah, uh, by the way, um, uh, Michael, we do use it like a NAS kind of thing. Basically, we have a directory mm -hmm. that is shared between handle the uh, the DAC, which which was a pain for me. So I just was like, okay, I'm just going to use the the file mm -hmm. system firewall to configure the file accesses. It was wow. it was a much it mu it was much a cleaner way than managing um, groups in Unix. Interesting. Oh, head explodes. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Ryan, you got all that. Yeah. Just Did we drive you. all the uh, poor? Um... So let us use us away with our freebies, the only topics. Oh, no, Andrew's brave. Bless your heart, Andrew. And although, hey, you're running, I believe, virtualized like P, uh, PFSense and Wealthies, <laughs> all this uh, bucket of fun might apply to you. Oh, we did lose. Yeah, but I don't usually Daniel. have to deal with any of this stuff for. Uh... <laughs> but you mm -hmm. could. <laughs> but... Uh. Does the Solaris have proper support for automatically deciding which. Uh, Nick features to turn on or off uh, in a certain configuration with crossbow. Oh yeah, it does. Uh, we we run because we run uh, the, uh, the, the Omni OS and uh, we're, we're, mm -hmm. with crossbow, and we never had that problem. The only time when we needed to handle that, which is the time that we learned that we that we need that, which the which is the line that Michael did document above, that when you're running an IDS, so some, something mm -hmm. that needs BPF and needs the packet as is. Then you will have to say you know minus LRO minus TSO for the IDS to work properly. Mm -hmm. um, that's on that's on our uh, Omni OS experiences. So uh, yeah, Omni OS is really you... good about doing the most sensible thing ninety nine percent <laughs> of the time. Can you tell us how the VNIC is implemented? How much? Does it depend on a certain NIC feature or is it all just software and you pay the expected software overhead? Or... I'm out of the topic of that. I, I, I don't know their code base. So uh, okay. anything from you? I'm afraid I'm not the person to be asking that either. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe if you get, maybe if Andy's in here another day. He was here last week, amazingly. Um, so the question is: Is is Crossbow hardware assisted at, in, I guess, the at, by the NIC and perhaps help perhaps up the CPU? So, I don't know. The question: It has a lot of features, and some of them probably are software. But which ones are? How much overhead on which hardware? Yeah, interesting. I expect mm. it's going to be a. It, it depends, kind of answer. And do they have Probably. a bridge we can steal because of FreeBSD bridge zone? Hmm? Flat out terrible. Do they have a bridge we can steal? No. Why would you? When have you last tested with FreeBSD bridge? Well, that was. I'm just thinking earlier in this conversation about the. No, no, the FreeBSD bridge isn't the problem. Ah, do tell. The FreeBSD 13.0 and newer bridge driver has been. They're better. Largely yes. rewritten by uh, Christoph. Christoph, yes. Uh, it now scales well with at least 16 or so cores. Okay. Seen any benchmarks mm -hmm. on that? And 
the packet rate is now really nice and it's just, that's not the problem. FreeBSD can now bridge fast in software. Okay, so but then software. hardware TSO LR are, are problematic, those, you say? Or what exactly are those we are offloading features with? available in silicon and firmware yep. on Nix to help the simplest but most common and highest throughput use case, namely servers terminating connections. Not routers, not switches, even if they're software bridges. And to help them use less CPU cycles per megabit. Got it. If you turn them off, bridging, address translation, stateful packet inspection, and so on, uh, dealing with creatively fragmented and overlapping fragment attacks and stuff, because that's another thing TSO can uh, suffer from, or LRO. Uh, if someone gets creative and sends you multiple copies of overlap, there's no proper way to... Yeah, put in, there is no um, correct reassembled representation for this. And do you even want, if it just happens that all of the possible permutations of those packets, which cover the whole byte range in the stream, happen to result in the same uh, content for the TCP stream? Do you really want to continue the connection if you're if somewhere along the path there's someone My answer reordering to that is no. the bytes. Well, <laughs> it could be that you may want to, but it should the firmware can't know what the operator wants to do in this case. And yeah. I don't know. That sounds like somebody's pulling shenanigans to do yeah, some kind of but, attack to me. Yeah, but Let's see. You say you have one broken router, which results in packet duplication along two paths. Um, some very aggressive active-active failover configuration, which failed and now forwards along both paths. And then you have two paths in those with different MTU limits. You you still get everything and there's no malicious attacker. It's just a crazy broken network, but you could get the data through it if you decide to accept a certain representation, but <laughs> yeah, it's nothing there. It's just insane to expect your network to continue in this broken state. Yeah, I think it is. <clears throat> you all successfully avoided the topic of Occam BSD that Antrenig and I have been discussing <laughs> one to one. Get good okay, work. So Congratulations. Your... No, no, no. We're <laughs> we've successfully avoided it. I'm I'm glad we did. Um Jan, you might uh, you might be slightly interested and Andrew even less so, but I've been cutting down FreeBSD to its absolute bare minimum and decades of bugs are now resolved so you can actually do it. And so we've been discussing how to build back from nothing or from the bare minimum such that mm -hmm. uh, we had a meeting and I added jail support so that he can test his own product using it. And Is this and by the way, Michael, as of, as of t -t today in the morning, I did release my product with Ocam BSD. Jeez. Oh, okay. Uh, the war There's no warranty, by the way, but okay, cool. Um, so we did an ideas doc there that I've linked, and uh, I, we are totally open to where this goes because it's like he, I was focusing on, well, jail and virtual machines and in Beehive, but then, well, jail's on all the different platforms. So how do we add different multi-platform support? Mm -hmm. And that raises the question, how do you have a class lab in, say, Uganda or Latvia with say Raspberry Pi 400s and you have a system that's small enough to build world during the class rather than next week. Um, so it's it's a fun one and we, we think we have some solid use cases and uh, yes, Jan. There are two more features you may want to think about for reducing yes. build times. 
I assume you've already uh, made use of um, uh, in in my case, yes. You repeat that? Um, I lost the keyword. Uh, okay, Me I will meta just mode. Oh, meta mode. Oh, of course. Yeah, uh, no, uh, that solves some use cases. Uh, it still doesn't solve the the class lab problem where your first build takes like you know. My, on a Raspberry Pi, say well, four hours you for just an hour long class. Put but, yeah. a pre populated object directory. Uh, in yes, your true. Image. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but. No, it's you're not wrong. Correct. And the other thing you could uh, think about is an, um, running a disk CC. Uh, or, that, for the love of me, I or, couldn't figure it out. Or, ah, um, yes. And, do you have a just um, do you have a CC tutorial cache for that? CC supports <laughs> a Redis mode, I think, or memcache memcache uh, mode, or something like this, where the compiler cache, memcache. Uh, okay. CC cache ca is a wrapper around your compiler to hash the input and then look it up in a hash table, and you can have a network cache. And if you have lots of students in a class connected to an Ethernet network or yeah. a reasonably well-working wireless network, but I've yet to encounter this in the university context or classroom context, then it's possible to share this compiler cache because uh, Raspberry Pi or similar single board computers are almost always uh, also I.O. Uh, constrained on yes. their local storage. And the, and most of them are pretty memory constrained as well. So, okay, a Raspberry Pi 4 with four or eight gigs of memory has enough to be useful. And it may make sense to bite the bullet and use UFS instead of ZFS to uh, ah, yes. reduce memory uh, footprint. Uh, Jan, do you have just CC working? Because it sounds like Anton and Ace could not get it working. I haven't working. used it in a long time. Ah, like same, same here. At least eight years or so. And uh, and I have to say, compared to the time that I last used it, which was eleven years ago, and a much changed piece of software. Uh, mm -hmm. I like from a compiler engineer point of view. By the way, not from a. Uh, an administrator mm -hmm. point of view. Uh, from for our class specifically, the goal was to do a modification in in FreeBSD and uh, deploy it into a jail as fast as possible. Obviously, I understand the need for meta mode, and um, hopefully on Saturday we'll have a good demonstration with OCAM, where before going to the class, I'll just run it on the server. It will build. I arrive there. Now every change that we do will take you know a minute or two instead of an hour or two. And the, the, these are, you know, n not Raspberry Pis, but also not powerful computers. They're just regular, the, the university type desktops, you know, there's sure. nothing to be, yeah, to expect too much yeah. from them. It has pump mode. And the other thing is, if you're setting up a curriculum, I would reconsider spending the money on a single server or two servers instead of lots of single board computers, unless you want to get into driver development and mm. embedded systems stuff. If you want to teach an operating systems course, it would be, make more sense to use a bigger box because then you can dynamically share the resources. Yes. And your modern single socket epic with half a terabyte of RAM. Uh, yes, yeah, but we're talking about environments where that yeah. is just a dream. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, is, you yeah, only exactly. need one person. Yeah, oh, you only need. I get that, but I'm tired of people saying, get, "Oh, yeah. a 128 core ampere system would be better than what you've described." It's like, yes, I'm well aware of that. That that's great. But that, but, 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 but computers is like you know two thousand dollars max, and that sometimes, that includes the, that includes uh, the networking. <laughs> okay. Sometimes um, even one is not possible. Yeah. Yeah. One thousand uh, for a server or one big box. No, no, no. Just like, uh, oh, I see your point. I see your point. No, unfortunately, uh, this is a very, you know, not, uh, this is a very specific problem with universities yeah. and institutions that don't have a lot of money, but OCAM did come to the rescue. And currently on my Mac, uh, a fanless mm -hmm. MacBook that's running a FreeBSD VM, 
I'm able mm -hmm. to compile FreeBSD with meta mode, uh, not the first run, yeah, the other runs in around five, five, 10 to 15 minutes. But the first run oh, takes around, fast. yeah, it's very fast. Michael, how, how long did, was the first no, no, run? That's I think worse than I expected. Uh... Uh, oh well, I, I so if you look at the very first line of the minutes of this meeting, my epic is toast on fourteen, so I can't get some really exciting numbers beyond the ones I've posted elsewhere before. Um, so it's like you know a minute or two for a complete build world, and the kernel is a few seconds. But, but wow, that, I, the storage controller is toast. Picky picky. Anyway, um, not that I have you an opinion. You're going on. to be disappointed running this on a really big epic. Uh, because you will find out that there are uh, bottlenecks in how much concurrency uh, the make scripts uh, can exploit. Mm -hmm. True, so but they're better at, than ever. At about eight and they've resolved a whole bunch of concurrency issues. Question. Jobs, uh, you will find that it doesn't matter if you have 16, 32, or 64 cores uh, for meta mode with a almost unmodified build. Exactly. Because uh, yeah. All the time, you, 90 plus percent, it's Atmel's law of your compute t wall time is spent calculating dependencies and running scripts, which aren't parallelizable. Correct. No, no question. And maybe there are opportunities for improvements there now that the, the plumbing is quite good. Um, and I, I'll um, throw into the mix using tempfs for like an object directory and all the disposable uh, stuff. That, that so doesn't really matter, especially not on UFS because of uh, Cox's cleverness in the dark ages. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, UFS has delayed, uh, so the whole soft updates, if you use soft updates without journaling, so the original soft update, yeah. it's very uh, efficient at delaying any write. So it's a total write back cache system. You just cache. Object you cut file. out there. Sorry? Uh, understand soft, that? soft updates without journaling delays writes, like a write-back cache? It's a write-back cache. And you can write to a, a temp file, like pre-process some source file, compile it, delete the temporary file, and it never materializes on disk. No kidding. Okay. And the other thing is, which UFS, uh, which is one of the reasons why um, Netflix still uses UFS 